This is The Instigators, presented by Seneca Resorts and Casinos. Nothing else comes close. We are going to We are inching closer to the Olympic Games, which will be a big focal point, Marty, of this upcoming conversation on Instigators Overtime because we're thrilled to be joined by Cassie campbell Pasco. Yes, we know the women's hockey rivalry runs deep between Canada and the U.S., and we had Cami Granato on recently, so Cassie's going to provide her insight from the Canadian side, but I mean, holy cow, what an absolute resume she has crafted over the course of her playing and post-playing career amazing resume in her career but i am so impressed with what she's done over the last 15 plus years working as a tv analyst uh color analyst uh everything that she's done and funny enough i believe if wikipedia is correct that her first big break as a color analyst on uh hockey night in canada was because harry neal was snowed in in buffalo we know what that's like. We had a lot of snow in Buffalo the last few days. So Harry couldn't get to Toronto and Cassie was there. She jumped in and the rest of history. And she has worked in so many other capacities, some well-known, some not, but so connected to the game. And obviously we love our connection with Seneca resorts and casinos. And when you're serious about the game, bet on Buffalo at the only sports books in Western New York's that Seneca resorts and casinos betting counters, which are open daily. And of course, self-service betting kiosks are available 24 seven at all three locations. Whether you visit Seneca Niagara, Allegheny or Buffalo Creek, the sports lounge features the latest lines and multiple screens so you never miss a play. The Sportsbook at Seneca Resorts and Casinos, where the love of the game meets the thrill of the win. Cassie, it's great to see you. And obviously, it is an incredibly exciting time for you to be amidst the NHL and the way that you are right now, and especially on the heels of the ESPN all-women's broadcast this week. I feel like we have 9 million things to get into with you, but why don't we start <laughs> there? How did, how did that broadcast Montreal, Arizona go for you? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. I filled in for a colleague who couldn't make the broadcast, who happened to be a man, uh, last minute. And, you know, so my boss called me and said, can you do this? And I said, yes. And then all of a sudden they flew in Linda Cohn as well. And, and here we are. And I'm, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm proud of it. No question. I'm really proud of it. But I'm kind of tired of it at the same time. Like, let's move on. I just want to call the game. I just want to be part of it. Um, and you know, I'm honored to work for ESPN. I'm honored that they've asked me to come down South and work, but I just, I just want to talk hockey, whether I'm a man or a woman to a man or to a woman. And yes, I don't take it lightly. I understand it's, it's significance and I appreciate it. Um, but my colleagues who are with me were very capable and, and I'm just, you know, I'm glad it's over and looking forward to just calling hockey in the future. Well, I, that's what I wanted to ask you as well is because I know women in the, in the, in the sports and in the broadcasting world that are like, look, we do this every day. And it's not just you guys on the air, but there is production, uh, production assistant uh, tape. Uh, there's, there's women everywhere in the game. So it's almost like it's normal. You've been at this now for the last 15 plus years. So uh, for you and for many others in the business, it's normal. For some other people that are just new to watching the game on ESPN, maybe it's not. So how does that internal battle when you're asked to smile and say, hey, happy to be an all-girl team, but how does that work for you now stepping out and saying, look, there's many more that are doing the job? Well, I think that's the thing for me, you know, you know, going back to when I started with Hockey Night in Canada 16 years ago and, and got thrown in to do color, uh, you know, my second day in the job. And you know, understanding the significance of it, but also wanting to research the other women who'd been part of Hockey Night in Canada. And that was important for me to know and important for me to get out there. And, um, you know, I, I'm a hockey player through and through, just like you were and are. And yeah. it, it's, you know, we're team players and we, we want to be at the best. We want to be the best we can be. We want to be at the top. And that's kind of our mentality. But we also understand that a victory is a victory for all of us. And you know, that's the way I kind of approached it as a player, as the captain of a team, just, you know, doing whatever I can to contribute to make the game a winning outcome, uh, to do the best I can to make a good broadcast. And, and hopefully, you know, we all win at the end of the night. But it's, um, yeah, it, I understand there's a part that comes with all of this, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm kind of ready to pass the torch to all these women that are starting to do it now and, and the women before me that were doing it. Like, I, 
I'm just carrying a, this big heavy weight and passing it on and, and just trying to do a good job, I guess. Well, we love and appreciate the, the honesty in that first answer. And, and it, it, to me, begs the question because of your honesty there, like, I can totally understand why you're saying that and how it's, you know, without you saying it, it can be a little annoying. It's like, let's just do the job. But so where, like, how do you move forward? Like maybe why is it always the focal point right now? And I know you see the good in, in it being a focal point, but like, how do we move forward? So we're not constantly talking about this. Well, I think just continue to have representation and uh, right. continue to have, women, men, uh, black people, of you know, different ethnicities, you know, just keep having them present and keep having them involved. And, um, and just, you know, I, I still think you, you have to earn your right to be there on top shows. And, and, you know, you kind of have to take steps to get to those top shows, if you will. And, and you guys know that you, you, you know, you've worked hard at your craft and where you've gotten to go. And, um, so I don't know. All I know is this. It has something to do with social media. And you know, every day I have this dilemma of getting off social media. Like, I, I think that's a big thing now, especially with COVID. And it's always been around. But, you know, more people are at home, more people are like scanning, you know, scrolling their devices and watching and looking and getting fired up about equality and fired up. And those are great things to get fired up. But I, I sometimes say to myself, why am I on social media? Why am I reading this? What am I doing? You know, and um, I think that's just a big part of what we've dealt with through COVID is that was the way people can express themselves and debate and share their opinions even more so than they ever have. And because of COVID too, I think a lot of it has been negative as well, you know, more so than ever. And so you kind of take it with a grain of salt, but I, there's times where I think social media does a lot more harm than it does good. And um, you know, it, that's just the reality we live in, I guess. So how do you feel then when, you know, the world juniors was scheduled to go, I know it got canceled halfway into the tournament, but it was scheduled to go. And then the women's under 18 didn't get to go. So do you feel that it's because, well, let's push the women's game aside, but the boys, we really have to build it up because it's a big event. Or was it not a gender issue? How do you feel about those type of situation when it comes to the game that you love and yeah. you want to keep representing? Well, first of all, uh, Marty, the women's worlds was canceled before the men's <laughs> worlds was starting. And I think that's a big you know, difference in describing this. You know, it was disappointing. Um, but I got to tell you, it was even more disappointing to see the, the men's world juniors canceled because... I know financially the impact that's going to have on the IHF is going to be huge. And mm -hmm. so I do happen to know, and I, I've been working with the IHF, not, I, not a huge role, but I've been very invested in speaking with the president, Luke Tardif. Um, I was just on a, a meeting recently with all the key female stakeholders from all the countries speaking with him. Uh, and I will keep him honest and I will keep him making sure that he's still believing in women's hockey. I, I believe that a lot of these events are going to be rescheduled COVID allowing in between June and August. Um, listen, I, I was just as disappointed about the world junior championship as I was the female championship, but I will tell you this, the one thing that bothered me most was to have our, our women's world championship in Halifax canceled when it was going to be played under the same bubble restrictions as what the world junior championship was going to be played at last year and it got yeah. played to its entirety you know that probably bothered me the most this time around i think the the new variant came just so quickly that the bubble wasn't quite the same for the world juniors as it was last year the previous year yeah. and i think if it was it probably would have been able to play but we couldn't predict the future um but i think there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that that people don't understand and um you, it, it just seemed too easy to cancel women's tournaments throughout this pandemic. And we understand why it's a pandemic. We get all the implications uh, of our, on our healthcare system, all those types of things. But when the same rules and the same set of bubble standards are occurring for women's championships that are getting canceled and for men's championships that are allowed to go on, that's where I question sort of the system. Uh, but I, I'm a solution-based person. And uh, I, I feel I, I have a role to speak out on behalf of the women's game, but I'm also solution based. And that's what I'm doing now behind the scenes to help push 
and make sure that these women's championships are rescheduled. And as long as along with the world junior championship, because I know of its importance, plus I want to watch it as a fan. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's really all I'll say on that because uh, I know that I I do a lot more behind the scenes than people know. And I actually know a lot about what happens behind the scenes that people know. And I express my opinions based on the facts that I know. How is your interest level excitement level for the upcoming Olympics for both the men and the women? Well, you know, a a lot of people don't know because I haven't really put it out there too much, but I've actually been a management consultant for our women's team the last three years with team Canada. And, uh, you know, after they won a bronze medal, I was this old alumni sitting at home, you know, mad at the television and, and I thought, you know, what can I do to help? You know, we, we hadn't uh, won a world championship since 2012 at that point. And, and then all of a sudden we're getting a bronze and I'm like, okay, this is it. Like, you know, I, I need to come back and help and do whatever I can. And not to say that I'm going to be the answer, but, you know, it, rather than just talk about it again, I'm a solution-based person. So how do I help? And so I've been really in a part-time role behind the scenes and, and our program is led by Gina Kingsbury, who's a former teammate of mine and our coaching staff led by Troy Ryan has been amazing. And, you know, we were able to win the world championship in August, which I think was a huge stepping stone, but I'm jacked for the Olympics. I'm my fingers, my toes are crossed that, you know, all the athletes from every sport from every country can get there safely and, and without testing positive. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of what the Olympics can do for sport and for humanity, quite frankly. And I know there's a lot of controversy over China, but, um, I I think from an athlete perspective, you just want to go and compete at the highest level of something you've trained for. And you hope to make a difference in those other areas by speaking up when the time is right, but I'm excited about team Canada. And, you know, I'm excited about the competition team USA. They've been really good this year, Finland as well. Switzerland's really improving and, I'm just excited about the increased parity that we're starting to see in the female game. Well, obviously, I look back to a few years. I remember we had the under-18 Women's uh, World Championship here in Buffalo at the Lecom Harbor Center. Uh, we also had the uh, the Buffalo Buttes. Um, you know, it may have changed management and all, but I remember at a time where that league was thriving. Now, your upbringing in hockey was different. So how do you combine what you lived you know, through your youth and what the girls game is living now and be able to find a way to, to achieve success and, and help the, you know, team Canada or, or anybody trying to get to their success. You know, I, I think it, just to watch the, the game grow has been, you know, such a, a tremendous thing for me to watch it. You know, when I played and the players that played even before me, you know, who really set the foundation uh, all over the world. And, and just to see the opportunities that the young players are getting now, I think it's really important. And, and for me, it's, you know, just, just to see the, the amount of attention that women's hockey is starting to get, which is, is something that hasn't always happened in the past. And, you know, we've got the situation with the, the leagues and everything that's going on behind the scenes. And I think that's going to rectify itself here in the near future. And um, I, I truly believe for once, we're going to have a true professional league and, um that's going to last and it's going to have proper infrastructure and you know I think the timing here of this Olympics is really key and really important and I I wouldn't be surprised if we we see something uh that's really fruitful for the game that's really sustainable for the game come out of these Olympics and so I'm looking forward to that and and just you know how many people are passionate about it like you know you guys your generation you've always accepted us as women playing hockey you know anytime I was reporting on, on your games, Marty, you know, you guys would always just come over and talk and say hello. And, you know, you, you knew who I was in the sense that I was a female hockey player. And I always appreciated that. And I think it's just great to see so much support, you know, from people that have been outside the women's game now, finally speaking up and talking about the importance of the game and acceptance of the game and knowing how these girls train and are professional as can be without necessarily getting the money. So um, you know, we thank a lot of people for their voices who finally stepped up and, and believe in us. And, and I think that's really been a key part of our evolution. Well, the premier hockey federation, you know, as of our time of recording this, making big news with uh, a massive investment that will more than 100% increase the, the salary cap, uh, moving forward for players and uh, a couple of expansion teams too. Um, when, since you've mentioned this a few times, as, as a problem solver, um, what is your best case scenario for women's hockey, premier hockey foundation 
Um, and, and I guess what I'm getting at is how much would it benefit to have direct tie-in with National Hockey League teams? So it grows, you know, more like the WNBA, if you will. Well, I think it's essential to the growth of our game and, um, you know, to, to already have the infrastructure that's in place from the NHL. And it's, it's been something I've been pushing for for a long time. And, you know, I think COVID set us back in that regard. Obviously, you know, the NHL was dealing with a lot of its own internal things and, and financial situations based on the pandemic. And of course, that's the number one priority. I, I do know women's hockey is a huge priority for the NHL. And um, I just believe that for us to have a true professional, sustainable league that isn't about social media posts, that isn't sort of smoke and mirrors, I do think we need the NHL to be involved. And so that's what I continue to push for behind the scenes. And, you know, I, I hope there's many women's leagues that survive and thrive and get sponsorships. And But I, I don't see anything at this time that is any different mm -hmm. than when I played. And, and to me, you know, I haven't played for a long time. It's been 16 plus years. And, you know, I still kind of see the same kind of situation as where I played. And, um, it, you know, I, I just I just believe in the NHL backing. And I know there's people out there that don't. People think that we can survive on our own. Uh, I don't happen to believe that. And I, I feel like we need their infrastructure. And I think, you know, you look at the PWHPA and what they're fighting for. I, I know they believe in the same thing and they want it to be sustainable moving forward. And they want it to be something that lasts long term, unlike many of the leagues that we've had in the past. And some of which I've been a part of and some of which I've been part of board member, you know, on the member of a board and been fighting for and it, things just haven't worked out. So, um, you know, I'm just hoping that uh, we have a good announcement here coming down the road. Now, you're incredibly smart. And listen, it's not just uh, because I want to give you a compliment. It comes across on TV. And when you speak, it's awesome. Um, I know your husband is I know Brad. Um, he uh, he was he's an assistant general manager. I want to see, like, where do you think you are going to go? Because now the Montreal Canadiens had their search for GM and they had a couple of women on their candidate list. Daniel Savageau was, was one of them. And um, so for you, after doing this 16 years, is there a path where you may follow or pursue a, uh, a an office job or a, a hockey department job or even a general manager job? in the NHL at some point or any other league? Like I say the NHL because I think you'd be really qualified for it, but um, any leagues? You know, I, I think uh, I think there's definitely an interest. I don't know if it's something I'm pursuing. Um, you know, I have had some conversations with a few teams. Um, you know, for me personally, with my husband's situation in Calgary too, it, it has to be a great fit, first of all, to leave the job that I currently have. I mean, it's a really good gig. As you know, you still get to be involved in the game and around the people in the game. You get to talk hockey, you get to watch hockey. You know, I know I could do a job. I, you know, my husband comes home and he's the assistant general manager of the Calgary Flames. He's like, Cass, what do you think of this player? What about this? And, you know, we, he knows I'm watching. You know, he, I watch just as much hockey as probably anyone else that watches the game. I, I love watching it. And uh, thank God for you know, those condensed games and the PVR games, you know, you can, you know, scroll them back and, and the, you know, the ESPN app that I have access to now. And I, I, I would love to entertain any NHL job for sure. It's be something I'd listen to. Um, but for me, it has to be a really good fit. It has to be something that would allow me to leave television and also potentially figure out how my family would live in two different places. Um, so you know, there would be a lot to think about behind the scenes, but I, I definitely entertain an NHL team job and would be excited and honored to have those opportunities. And I'm excited to, to know that many women are starting to have conversations with NHL teams. And, and I think it's important. And I, I think that a lot of us, Danielle Sobojo, as you mentioned, I think she would have a lot to offer the Montreal Canadiens. And, you know, at the time of this interview, uh, they have a new general manager but I think she would be someone that could really help their hockey ops department. And she's done a lot in the women's game. She watches a lot. She's connected. And, and I think, um, you know, it, it, I, I like Nick Lidstrom, you know, he's going to live in Sweden and he's going to be the vice president of hockey operations for Detroit. Now, by no means am I saying I'm comparing myself to Nick Lidstrom, who was one of my favorite players, but I'm thinking to myself, that's a pretty good gig. I can still stay at home and I can still you know, <laughs> dabble in all the departments. 
Um, so who knows, Marty, who knows what's going to happen. But I, you know, I think like you, right, you, you, you entertain, you listen, you want to have conversations, you want to learn, you want to meet people, you want to be around people who are in the game. And that's no different for me. I'm not trying to push him out of the chair, Cassie, but I did put him on the spot on the podcast last week about his pursuit of hockey front office type jobs. And he admitted that it's, you know, definitely in his mind. So we'll, we'll see where this all ends up, but I'm most curious what you think of today's NHL. And, you know, again, we have to kind of COVID everything here. So we understand that there's issues that are beyond their control, but What's the what's the big pressing need, desire, in your opinion, uh, for the NHL to just keep growing and 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 be everything we want it to be? Well, I'll tell you a story, and and, and my math might be a little off as far as dates, but there, there's a World Safety Automobile Agency, and they were trying to figure out how women were getting more seriously injured in car accidents than men. You know, and they were going through all this testing and doing all this stuff. And finally, they hired a female engineer who was part of this, you know, bigger committee. And one of her first things, well, have you ever done the car testing with female size weighted dummies, you know, with the distribution of a female body? And they were like, no, you know, and so that seems like common sense, right? It does. And, I, and I'm not picking on this world automobile agency. I'm not even sure what the name of it is, um, but like. Those are the types of decisions that by not having diversity within an organization that wants to win, where you're going to miss some things, you know, you're going to miss some steps. And that's what I think diversity is really key for is to have different perspectives on different issues, on the same issue. Um, and, you know, it, it's for me, it's never been I, I'm woman, hear me roar. It's, you know, I'm a woman and I'm knowledgeable and I, I bring something to the table and it's different from maybe other perspectives that are currently around the tables now. Um, and I also think in this day and age, you know, when Marty and I played, coaches could say whatever they wanted to us, you know, like they could just give it to us. They could, you know, and, and we just learned to accept that and take it. And I think nowadays players need to know more information. And that's where I think, for an example, a woman could come in and, you know, the communication styles and, and different things could be more beneficial for the current player who just simply needs to know more, who needs to have that constant interaction, that constant communication. You know, for Marty and I, it was like, if the coach wasn't talking to us, that was a really good thing. You know, we're like, <laughs> all right, we, we're, we're playing well. And if they started talking to us, we're like, okay, oh no, something's going wrong. And, um, and I think that's the way the current player is a bit different in the sense that they need that constant communication, the constant iPad time, the constant you know, sort of influx of information. And, um, you know, that's where I think a woman could definitely beneficial, not to say the man can't do the same thing, but I, I just think there's a difference in the way women interact and communicate with people at times um, mm -hmm. because of motherhood, because of whatever, because of so many different things. Um, but, you know, that I just think that's what people miss sometimes about diversity is that it helps all of us make better solutions for our problems. Um, and, and I think it's really key for hockey organizations as well. You talk about diversity. So you broadcast through with Sportsnet, Hockey Night in Canada, in Canada, and you do ESPN in the U.S. So is there a different way to prepare or to bring the game to different audiences? It's diverse. The Canadian people don't watch the game the same way the American people do. So how do you prepare for uh, different broadcasts in different uh, countries? You know, I think generally it's the same, but I, I would say if I'm working for ESPN, I, it's a little bit more story based and, mm -hmm. and simply because I think they're still working out the kinks and everything behind the scenes and having hockey back. And, you know, in Canada, I push a button and say, I want this play. I want this. I want this. Well, they, it's there like in two seconds because everyone behind the scenes works, lives and breathes in hockey. Whereas you go down south and you, you work with ESPN. You know, a lot of our people behind the scenes, their number one sport is basketball. Their number one sport they cover is football. Um, so they're learning about the game. And that's one thing that I've enjoyed working with ESPN with is that they want to learn. You know, they're, they're picking our brains every single chance they can get behind the scenes, our producers, you know, our tape guys and girls. And um, so I would just say it's a little bit more storytelling because you're not always sure what replay you're going to get or if you're going to get one sometimes on ESPN. And, and I think that'll change and evolve over time. Um, 
but it, it really is the same. And I'm actually enjoying Marty. Like when you work up in Canada, you're always sort of covering the same team. You know, it's always Canadian teams. And so for me, it's, you, you know, you get a U.S. team and you're like, oh, man, well, I haven't seen this team in a while. Whereas now I'm kind of a little bit more um, knowledgeable about the entire league because I'm not just doing Canadian matchups. I'm doing American matchups and I'm, you know, seeing Minnesota, who I don't often see very often, Arizona, who I... You know, you don't get a chance to see them up in Canada too often. Um, so I just feel a little bit more knowledgeable about the league, actually, because as you know, until you cover a team and you're there and you're in the nuts and bolts of it, sometimes, you know, you, you're not getting a chance to watch them um, until that moment. So I, I feel like a little bit more knowledgeable and lucky that I'm able to work both sides of the border. Well, I still have a Canadian passport, so I feel like I'm allowed to say this. Um, <laughs> uh -oh. I. I have always felt that Canadian media cannibalizes the game a bit. Um, you know, it's it's just just the way I've always felt. Um, now, they describe, pick, they, can you describe I don't know that what that word. means. Yeah, yeah I don't know that what that word. means. They just it's, eat it's it up. It's an open-ended word in those terms. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I mean, I just, I wish they would celebrate it more. I wish they would celebrate the good things more as opposed to picking and picking and picking yeah. and picking and picking. That being said, like, I, I, like, how do you view the game right now, Cassie? Like, are there things that as a player you constantly see and you wish, oh, if they would just tweak this, it could be better for the player or better for the game. Like what, what do you see given how close you are to it? You know, it's funny, you know, since going back with our women's team, uh, I've been privy to coaches presentations and, you know, the different things and how they look at the game through a different lens than I would have ever looked at it. And, because I always looked at it through as a player or a former player. And I, I find that's one of the hardest things for me is, is I need to focus sometimes more on what one team is doing right versus what someone just did wrong. You know, and I, I, I flip flop back and forth on that. And, and, you know, you're absolutely right. Like I think up in Canada, we, we tend to, we're so fiery about it and we're like, ah, oh, you know, um, like I, I, I just recently covered uh, Montreal, Arizona. And Yoel Armia addresses the media before game day. And he's the first question he's asked, of course, he only has one goal and he just signed a new deal. And, you know, why haven't you been scoring? And he, his answer, and you could see him, he, he was just like, I don't know. And, and he was honest. He's like, I, I don't know. So then the second question is the same question. And then the third question is, you know, and they're like looking for a different answer. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm watching this interview and I know my colleagues are doing an amazing job, but I'm thinking, we can't ask that question anymore. Like the poor guy, you know? And so I wish we were a little less like that up in Canada, but at the same time, we're so passionate. Um, and I think that's one thing that working down South has helped me. You're right. It's just, there's a lot of positives in the game. There really is. And we do need to celebrate how tough these guys, and I know there's tougher situations going on in the world right now, but the tough environment that these players are playing in with COVID and the pandemic and the isolation and the nervousness of being tested every single day, not knowing if it's going to be negative or not. And the stress of that. And, and I know everyone's going to say, Oh, well, they're multi-million dollar players. I, I, whatever that they're humans. And yeah. um, <clears throat> if I can say that you're right, the, there is a bit of a switch. I think in my perspective of working on ESPN and down South is, mm -hmm. There's so many positive things about this game. There's so many great stories in the game. And I think that's helped me be stronger when I do Canadian matchups, you know, um, but the coach, you know, being in these coaching presentations and different things I've been working on over the last three years, you do look at the game from that perspective and you're, you know, nitpicking and pointing out because you're, you're all about wanting to make the team better, right? That's, that's your sole purpose. Um, so that is, I think there's always that internal struggle for sure. And especially because I've, not necessarily associated with one team, right? Where you're supposed to be pro one team. I'm kind of supposed to talk about every team and be objective and unbiased and all those types of things. And so I think that's the constant, the struggle that you, you kind of deal with. Okay, so two Olympic gold, six world championship gold, but the one medal I want to talk about is your husband, Brad, being our public relations communication guy at the 2003 world championship. <laughs> How often does he bring the tournament up? Because I was with that team and I was the third goalie with Sean Burke and Roberto Luongo. So I hung out with him quite often and the coaches and we went late to watch NHL playoffs. We were in Turku, Finland. I mean, there wasn't a lot to do, but we, we found things to do. So how often does he bring up 
the gold medal that we won in 2003 compared to all the gold medals that you had. Oh, is that the one where you actually had to play in the exhibition it, game? Yes, that, yes, that's what I was saying. Andy Murray was our coach. And yeah. then he put them up with Matthew Dandeno. I think they were partners on defense and they had to play together, which was fantastic. He tells this really funny story about Matthew Dandeno, who at the time he had just come in and I don't think he knew who Brad was. Like, he's like, who is this guy sitting beside <laughs> me on the bench? And um, yeah, he like, he thought Andy Murray was playing a joke on him. So he, you know, he goes to the world championship. He works for Hockey Canada. And as you guys, you know, Get, get put out of the playoffs players start to come over and they needed a player and so he like hasn't played since like 1995 at this point and he, sure enough he gets equipment he goes out and I think he ended up playing like two or three shifts if I'm correct yeah. and there he is you know amongst like NHL stars and and you know all these you know European countries and stuff and that is a memory he, to, he loves it and he remembers specifically Matthew Dandino looking at him on the bench like like, who is this guy? Like, should I know him? Does he play in the league? Does he play in Europe? Like, you know, some of the funny stories. And another funny story about him is in 98 Olympic year, uh, Rod Brindamore's wife was pregnant and they were taking the team photo of the men's and the women's team together. And, and Rod Brindamore couldn't make it. Obviously he was at home with his wife. They were having a child. And, and so my husband actually stands in in the photo and then eventually they just Photoshop his head and they put Rod Brindamore's head. But we have the actual photo of him, you know, standing there pretending to be Rod Brindamore. And, you know, just some of the things you got to do, right, for the benefit of the team and to help the team out. And, and uh, he's, he's definitely got some good world championship stories for sure. No wow. disrespect to Brad, but my guess is that if he was going to pick one player to have as the body double, like you're going to go Rod yeah. the Bod Brindamore, are you not? Like I know. <laughs> I know. but at least he had the jersey and the shoulder pads on so like whatever um oh but my yeah of all the players you're right Rob well Bob. it's funny you mentioned um you know just the kind of maybe feeling a little out of place that reminded me of the mike johnson story of when he showed up in toronto and he's fresh out of college and it's end of season and whatever and larry murphy at like team breakfast like sees him he's like what are you a contest winner <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, but, but looks so young. He doesn't right. really one bit. Yeah, but we also have to know Brad was drafted by the Sabres, played yeah. in Rochester some games. So it's not like this PR guy that is playing beer league that's never played. Like, and Andy Murray, I remember the one practice. So Andy Murray was a coach in LA and St. Louis, and, and he liked to prepare practice beforehand. He'd give you all the drills in the locker room. And there was no time at the whiteboard during practice. You had to know. So guys were scared to go first. So they would let Brad go first and mess up the drills so that Andy couldn't yell at anybody because it was Brad's fault. Like you're going to yeah. yell at your PR guys. So, so that was an all time favorite memory in my hockey life or career is that O three three world championship when he got to dress and, and we had a we had a really good time. You know, it's funny. Um, uh, I because I think Craig Conroy was drafted by Buff. No, he was drafted by Montreal, right? Craig yeah. Conroy. I'm trying to yeah. Think. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he played. They were drafted. Him and Brad, my husband, were drafted in the same year. And my husband was actually drafted ahead of Craig Conroy, which is you know his only bragging rights with Craig because Craig went on, of course, to play over a thousand games. Yeah. But isn't that funny? How like you look at that it, the Flames they have. Corey Osmak, who's their equipment manager, who was drafted that year. Craig Conroy, who was drafted that year. And my husband, Brad, who was drafted that year. And <laughs> Connie, you know, he's the, he's the star, right? He gets to play so many games and captain the planes and all this stuff. But they, they yeah. go back and forth. And, oh, but I was drafted before you, Connie. And, you know, the stuff that they do behind the scenes to have some yeah. fun with it. So. Yeah, well, the Fab Five at the top of that draft was pretty darn good too, yeah. and uh, yeah. and I think Peter Bondra slid in behind both your husband and Conroy from a draft pick standpoint. So hey, you never know. Has has Brad ever brought up Buffalo and or Rochester at any point? Yeah, for sure. I um I know it, I never actually got to see. I, I met him post his career. He had just uh, retired actually, and. Actually, his first event for Hockey Canada, ironically, was a women's national team camp. Bob Nicholson said, hey, show up here. And really, it was just about meeting Bob and potentially getting an opportunity to work in the BC, you know, a, a, 
I think it was called the center of excellence at the time for hockey Canada. And we thought he was our team doctor, ironically, because our team doctor took sick and um, he was our next new face. So I'm not going to lie. I was like, whoa, you know, I might, I might have hurt my knee or something. I got to go see the team doctor. But um, uh. anyway, it all worked out. And, uh, but he, yeah, we, you know, I, I actually have photos that I've put up in my office of him and, you know, he's got his Rochester Americans uniform on and, um, you know, really proud of that. And, and, and his dad was just inducted to the CFL hall of fame. His dad's a broadcaster. And he was talking about, uh, seeing, uh, his, his son, my husband play for the very first time with the Rochester Americans in his speech. And so that was really kind of cool. And it's obviously a big part of his career. He's proud to have been drafted and, uh, you know, proud to have been part of the Buffalo Sabres organization, you know, for a little bit of a time. And it's a big part of his career. And, and it, he's been fortunate to transition and to still be involved in the game. And, um, you know, we're pretty lucky, like hockey's given us both a lot and, and uh, obviously each other and our young daughters. So that's the most important thing. And, and we both just love the game. And we have a real respect for what each other does, you know, so when we're both traveling and on the road, we have a real respect that the person at home just needs to be that extra support system. And we understand kind of what it takes and, and the time sometimes away from family that you take in this sport. But I think that's, that's really helped us have this good connection. We were lucky to have uh, Cami Granado on the podcast as well, a few weeks back and her and Ray sometimes put on the skates and do a little one-on-one. -on -one. She explained to us that Ray slashed her in the back of the legs and took her down one time as she slipped it like through his legs to get it to the other side. So Do you guys go on the ice once in a while? Is there still that fire, maybe a little outdoor pond hockey? You know, we, we, we're all both of the feeling that we know we're not nearly as good as maybe we once were. And so we don't play at all. Like I'm on the ice with my daughter's team, yep. but we recently, uh, we played shinny just after Christmas with another family, friends of ours. And that was kind of fun. And I remember back in 2000, the, the, uh, the, the new years, we had a guys versus girls sort of competition and we were playing, uh, against like a guy, Vidi Gomes, who used to work from Nike and my husband. And there was like four, four other guys. And I had brought all the national team members with me and we were just playing <laughs> shitty at an outdoor rink in Calgary. And it started out in their favor. And then the fitness kicked in because we were all still active athletes. And <laughs> those guys were like, oh, my gosh. And it was like three on three, which, you know, is really tough to play. You get bag skated pretty much the whole time. So we ended up winning. But I'll be honest with you, that's we don't get on the ice very much together. And and I'm really the only one that goes on the ice with my daughter's team. You know, my husband's always there as much as he can be and watches games and stuff. But we, we both kind of don't want to play anymore. It's weird. Yeah. And I think it's because we were sort of sad that you know, we're not even close to being where we once were, but we, and also our life is so much still about hockey that when you get a break, you kind of want to do other things as well, but we're both kind of of that mindset. Great. Marty, do you have this or dats lined up? I don't, you know what? My this or dats are going to be very simple for you. Um, I know you're very involved. And so basically I do this or that on our radio show. It's either or, right? So, um, So it's very simple. Please don't sit on the fence. Um, give me your, your side. Give me your opinion. Oh, so no. very simple. I'm in trouble. Uh, 2022 Olympic Games. This or that. I know you're close to Team Canada, but is it the Americans or the Canadians winning the gold at the end of it? Where do you see it? Well, I, I work for Team Canada. So I, know. I, I have to answer Team Canada. Okay, that's good. That's good. I listen. I know uh, girls on both teams. Uh, you know they're fantastic. So I hope it's like one of those overtime game and the stress level is through the roof. I'm really excited for it. Um, you were the the way you played. Um, you produce offensively, but you had some overall game, uh, 200 foot game, as they describe to your style. So this or that. Filling up the net or playing a strong overall 200 foot game? 200 foot game. Yeah. Wins championship. Did, did you ever have one of those goals where you were like, oh my goodness, I just surprised myself. Like I didn't know I had that 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 goal or that shot or that skill in me. I was usually the one that passed first on a breakaway, or I passed to Jana Heffer, Haley Wickenheiser, Daniel Goyette. Uh, you know, I was I was the one who maybe went in and got the puck and just passed it to the goal scorers. I wouldn't put myself in a goal scoring category. 
Okay, and probably last but not least, so you were the captain for Team Canada, and then after you, Haley Wakenizer became Team Canada, uh, uh, Team Captain for Team Canada. So not to, you know, compare all the captains, but who, in your opinion, was the best leader? And that's not so much a this or that, but the best leader with all of the Canadian teams that you are a factor in. By far, Vicky Sanahara. She wore uh, assistant captain, and I, I truly believe that uh, she could have easily been the captain of the team. And uh, one of my favorite teammates, just a glue player, two-way player, uh, would play any role, just a uh, tremendous leader. So I'd say Vicky Sanahara. Okay, and I guess one last one. Um, we didn't have the luxury of all the equipment. I still think I retired eight years ago and I still didn't have the luxury of what my son's equipment is like. I got to steal his gear for the one game a year that I play. Uh, but if you could have either the skates that the players have now, like they have the true skates, right? The old VH that are so comfortable and so performance-based or the sticks that the players have now to be able to shoot the puck, which one would you want to have in your game? This or that, the skates or the stick? The sticks. I, I think the biggest weakness of my game was playing with the tree trunk hockey stick and trying to shoot the puck, you know, the Ray Bork special, if you will. And, sure would. Uh, I, I, I shoot at my daughter's practice and I think I shoot better now than when I actually played. So I'm going to have to say the sticks, they're remarkable technology and the whip and the flex. And, you know, I, we didn't have really access to flex and all that stuff. We, we just got what was in the back room at Hockey Canada and, and that's what we use. So I'd have to say the sticks for sure. Okay. Well, listen, that's this for me, Duffer. This, <laughs> this is a loaded one. Uh, flames oh, or Oilers, yeah. which one makes the oh. playoffs? Oh, geez. Well, personally, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll do my unbiased opinion, I think it would be great for Sportsnet, who I work with, that both of them make it because I am dying to see the Battle of Alberta, of course. Um, you know, I think in the playoffs, we're all dying to see that. I think it would be great. You know, on a personal side of things, of course, I'd, I'd want the Flames to get in because that, that means hopefully my husband still has a job. Um, but I honestly, I, I, I hope it happens where both teams get in and we see finally, you know, that battle in the playoffs. Tampa Bay, three-peat or not? I, I I wouldn't put it past them. I think three-peat, they're so good. And I don't even think they've played their best hockey yet. Like, I, that's what is, you know, I think they've played a little bit of tired hockey this first half, if you will. And uh, I I just think goaltending, defense, uh, I think they, they have an opportunity there for sure. Mm, we haven't seen Vegas at full potential yet. Colorado or Vegas, who's the better team in the West? Well, if Eichel comes back and is completely healthy and able to play, you know, I, oh, that's a tough one, you guys, but I, <laughs> I, I think it's Vegas. I think Vegas. Awesome. Man. Hopefully I thank you, Cassie, for all the insight today yeah. that, I mean, you are literally a wealth of knowledge on so many aspects of the game. Uh, we benefit greatly from the conversation and uh, keep up the great work. We look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, well, guys, I appreciate everything you guys do. Love watching you and you've all, you know, we've been connected for many years now. And, and so I appreciate your friendship too behind the scenes and, and cheers to you guys. Thanks. Unquestionably, one of the top three stars in women's hockey, I'm going to say it, of all time, honestly, oh. like so well-rounded, just she's everything to the women's game and obviously to the NHL game now. She's a pioneer. She's so good. Thanks again to Cassie campbell Pascal. Yeah. And I love the fact that she's involved behind the scene. Yes, she has a job to do. She's a mother. There's a lot going on in her life, but she's involved talking to the right people and give her, her opinion. And I said in the interview, I think she's incredibly smart and it comes through when she speaks. Yeah. Everything is calculated. Uh, it's non-emotional. She really thinks about all the angles. I, I think she's fantastic for the, the, the NHL, the men's game and the women's game. Let's get to our three stars of the week. Okay, so I'll start with my three stars and they're non-hockey related. They're football related. They're Buffalo Bills related because the big win Saturday coming into this weekend playing at KC. The number three star is Josh Allen. I mean, breaking ankles all over the field, running wild, doing what he does best. He was incredible. The number two star for me, Duffer, Micah Hyde with that interception, unbelievable catch. Uh, it was the play of the, the game, really, for the Bills to take that away, a sure touchdown for the Patriots and the number one star, the man, the myth, 
the legend, Ryan Fitzpatrick in the stands, shirt off. Now, he did have the heaters over the top of him where he was sitting, so it wasn't really in the elements. But how amazingly cool is yeah. this guy? Like, I just, I, I mean, even if I went to the Bills game, took my shirt off, people would be like, hey, put it back on. He's the actual NFL player at a playoff game for another team and celebrating that way. Legendary first star for the week. Who's got more chest hair? Oh, for sure him. I mean, I'm, I may have to go and glue some on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, t- I'll try and stick to hockey here for my three stars, but I, I, I must say, honorable mention to uh, the Dallas Cowboys for giving us the ending <laughs> of their game that they gave us. <laughs> Oh, Pierre LeBron is so disappointed right now. I'm not. Oh my God. I loved it. That was absolutely classic. Honestly, though, when you think of the game in the past seven days, easy to overlook, but actually really important to focus on because you and I have been talking about goaltenders specifically and how they've been graduating quicker than usual from ECHL to AHL to NHL. The people that are in the game at the ECHL level that deserve so much attention and it goes so unappreciated, but every day they're helping fill spots and at the same time, fuel dreams for those who stay in the game at all levels. Congrats to Jason Payne, head coach of the Cincinnati Cyclones for the all-star appearance behind the bench. I mean, he is He is the epitome of just continuing the dream. And it was much talked about when he took over as head coach this year, you know, the only black coach in hockey right now in North American hockey. And this is absolutely earned and significant. And we're so happy for Jason. And it was just such, it was so terrific to see him get that opportunity in Jacksonville, not to mention Cincinnati's having a great season on the ice from a player standpoint right now, number two star for me. And this is a real struggle because I want to put him number one. Miko Rantanen is lights out right now. Like I, when I watch the avalanche and I mean, the numbers are the numbers, 27 points in the last 14 games, but he's barely had a blip at any point during the year. So there's not been marked drop-offs. Holy cow, full speed all the way through the game. And yeah, it helps that McKinnon is back, but Rantanen singularly is just an absolutely dynamic player right now but i have to give number one star to jonathan huberto because you know i dove into the numbers (laughs) and at the time of this recording he's got 20 points in an eight game point streak and all he's done in each of the last five years is elevate himself and elevate himself and elevate himself into a shorter list and shorter list and shorter list of top scorers in the game it's really impressive to see Huberto, and as his agent, Alan Walsh, will let you know on Twitter, because he's very active on Twitter, uh, is probably one of the best story this season. Alex Ovechkin with his scoring prowess. He slowed down a little bit, but still, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mid-20s in goals. So that's very impressive. Could be on pace for 50-plus again this year. But Huberto and the Florida Panthers, that battle of Florida, that battle of Sunshine State, please make it happen. First round, or maybe second round, but... You know, I wanted in the playoffs this year because uh, last year was entertaining and now it could be even better this year. Marty, great job. Thank you for lining up Cassie for the show. It was absolutely fun to be a part of. Thank you for watching, folks. We'll see you again next time on Instigators Overtime presented by Seneca Resorts and Casinos.